fixed income active management credit strategies a summary the first learning outcome has to do with risk considerations in investment grade and high yield bonds high yield bonds have relatively high credit loss rates which means that credit risk is a major concern with investment grade bonds we have relatively low credit loss rates and here we are more concerned with credit migration risk and spread risk spread risk is the risk that the spread of a bond over the risk free rate might go up or a bond might be downgraded because of which the spread relative to a government bond goes up spread duration is an important measure when we are concerned with spread risk this measures the effect of a change in spread on a bond's price approximately speaking it's the percentage increase in a bond's price if the spread decreases by 1% so let's say that for a given bond the spread duration is 5 and the spread decreases by 50 basis points or half a percent now if this happens the bond's price will go up by 2.5% which is half of 5 for non callable fixed rate bonds the spread duration will be roughly equal to modified duration but for floaters and other types of bonds that might have embedded options the two spread measures can be quite different so from an exam perspective if you are given both these spread measures you should always use spread duration investment grade portfolios have greater exposure to interest rate risk than high yield portfolios the reason is that credit spreads have a negative correlation with the risk free rate if we want to measure the overall impact on price given a change in interest rates we can use empirical duration this is a measure of interest rate sensitivity that is determined from market data and normally we come up with empirical duration using a regression of price return versus changes in the benchmark interest rate the empirical duration for high yield bonds tends to be much lower than the empirical duration for investment grade bonds and the major reason is this fact the fact that credit spreads have a negative correlation with interest rates so if overall interest rates go up the credit spreads tend to come down investment grades are more liquid than high yield bonds this implies that their riskiness is less with high yield bonds a major issue is credit risk which is what we said at the start of this lecture now this implies that the default rates are relatively high so we are concerned with the market value of a high yield bond portfolio and for this reason high yield bonds are quoted in terms of price investment grade bonds on the other hand are generally quoted in terms of spread over a government rate now let's talk about credit spreads these are the major credit spreads a benchmark spread is the yield on a credit security minus the yield on a benchmark bond if the benchmark bond is a government bond then the spread is called a g spread the g spread is fairly simple to calculate and generally different fund managers calculate g spread in the same way we can use the actual or interpolated government bond rate what this means is that let's say we are concerned with the g spread for a four year bond but we only have a three year bond available in the market and a five year bond say the three year bonds yield is 10% the five year bonds yield is 12% so the interpolated value for a four year bond would be 11% this method also indicates a way to hedge interest rate risk because through this method we can come up with the weightages of the two government bonds and to hedge interest rate risk we can simply take short positions in these bonds if we use the swap rate instead of the yield on a benchmark bond then our spread measure is called the i spread the government bond yield curve might not always be smooth because of supply demand issues in the government bond market but swap curves tend to be much smoother from a testability perspective if there is a choice between the g spread and i spread one major concern is where is there lower credit risk ideally this benchmark should have as low credit risk as possible next we come to the z spread which 
This is the constant spread that must be added to each point of the implied spot yield curve to make the present value of a bond's cash flow equal its current market price. This measure works for bonds without embedded options. If we do have embedded options, then the Z spread does not work. Then we should use the option adjusted spread. This is the constant spread that when added to all the one period forward rates on the interest rate tree makes the arbitrage free value of the bond equal to its market price. The OAS depends on assumptions regarding future interest rate volatility. Now, if the actual volatility turns out to be different from what we've assumed, then the realized spread will be different from the OAS. This measure is appropriate for the portfolio level spread, and that's because portfolios will often have bonds with embedded options. The portfolio OAS is based on the weighted average of the OAS of individual bonds in a portfolio. Now, from a testability perspective, you need to know the difference between the Z spread and the OAS. Let's say we have a callable bond, and for that callable bond, the Z spread is 60 basis points and the OAS is 50 basis points. What this implies is that the difference between these two, which is 10 basis points, is the approximate value of the call option that is embedded over here. If you have a situation where the Z spread is equal to the OAS, that would imply that the bond does not have any embedded options. Credit spreads and excess returns. So we've been talking about credit spreads. The credit spreads depend on the likelihood of default, the probable loss given default, credit migration risk, and market liquidity risk. So the higher these risks, the higher the credit spread. One of the terms we've used is credit loss rate. The credit loss rate is a product of these two terms, the likelihood of default times the probable loss given default. Another important term is excess return. This is the return of a bond after interest rate risk has been hedged. So this is the formal definition. We can say that the credit spread is equal to the excess return if there is no change in a security's yield or in interest rates and if the security does not default during the holding period. The formula for the excess return is given here. This assumes no default losses. If we do have default losses, then this is the formula and it's extremely important. This is the expected excess return. And this is equal to the spread times T, T is the time period in years, minus the change in spread times spread duration, minus the time period in years times the probability of default times the loss given default. Now this formula must be learned for S and delta S we can use percentages and again for this term we can also use percentages so the overall excess return will then be calculated in terms of a percent so if you are comparing two bonds a and b the bond with the higher expected excess return would be preferred now we come to the different approaches for selecting bonds and creating a portfolio one approach is the bottom up approach the bottom-up approach is also called the security selection strategy. It is based on the assessment of the relative value of individual issuers or bonds. That's why it's called security selection. This is appropriate for analyzing companies that have comparable credit risk. There are two broad steps here. Step one is to establish a universe of eligible bonds and then divide them into industry sectors. A starting point could be a benchmark. So we could identify the benchmark that we are measuring against and then we can look at the different sectors in the benchmark. Very often the sectors in a benchmark might not be perfect. So we might take a particular sector such as the energy sector and make it even more granular by identifying subsectors that are influenced by the same economic factors. So in a bottom-up approach, we need to be careful about coming up with industry sectors which behave in the same way to given macroeconomic variables. Once we've identified sectors and we know which bonds are in those sectors, then we should identify bonds with the best relative value within each sector. In coming up with best value, we need to look at spread versus risk. So. If we have two bonds A and B in a given sector, now all else 
equal if the option adjusted spread for bond A is higher than the option adjusted spread for B then that means that with a given level of risk we are getting a higher return for A so A is the better option we can say that bond A is underpriced or we can say bond A is cheap so the strategy would be to prefer A over B there are other variables to consider also so for example we might say that A has a spread of 90 and B has a spread over government bonds of 60 we might also then identify A as having a slightly higher risk than B so we then need to figure out whether the additional 30 basis points from A is worth it given the additional risk associated with A when evaluating bonds we also need to look at bond structure so if we are evaluating two bonds where one is senior the other is subordinated then obviously the subordinated bond has more risk and will have a higher yield we should also be concerned about issuance state bonds that have been very recently issued are called on the run securities they tend to have lower spreads and therefore higher prices we should be concerned about supply if a given issuer has recently substantially increased the supply then that would cause spreads to come down we should also be concerned about issue size for very large issues the liquidity tends to be high and the spreads tend to be low next we talk about the spread curve this is a fitted curve of the credit spread versus either spread duration or maturity so on the x-axis we might have spread duration or we might have maturity and on the y-axis we'll have the credit spread so let's say we are comparing two similar companies like AT&T and Verizon and if we look at their spread curves then we have something like this let's say this is AT&T and this is Verizon then for relatively long duration bonds if we can say that AT&T bonds and Verizon are very similar in the sense that both these entities have similar credit risk then Verizon bonds at this maturity seem to be a better deal than AT&T bonds because we are getting a higher spread we can also look at specific issues relative to the spread curve so if this is the fitted line and then we have a particular issue which is above the spread curve we might say that this is good value because the fitted curve implies this spread but the actual bond is giving us a higher spread so this might be relatively undervalued coming now to portfolios with portfolios position sizes can be based on market value or spread duration we should use market value if default risk is an important consideration so generally when we create a high yield bond portfolio we are creating it based on market value but if we are dealing with investment grade bonds where we are more concerned with spread risk then we should use spread duration as the mechanism for weighting the different bonds if a given sector has many attractively valued bonds then overall we might give a higher weight to that sector relative to the benchmark in creating our portfolio we should also consider other factors such as liquidity portfolio diversification and risk now a given bond might have a high return relative to another but an investor might prefer the liquid bond also sometimes an investor might prefer a bond based on its portfolio diversification characteristics rather than the excess return from that bond and also there might be times where an investor wants to reduce risk and prefers a lower risk bond even though the excess return or the spread might be relatively low next we have the top down approach the top down approach to credit strategy focuses on various macro factors such as economic growth overall corporate profitability default rates and so on in this approach we overweight attractively priced sectors and generally sectors in the top-down approach are much broader than sectors in the bottom-up approach when we come up with industry sector allocation we can do this based on our macroeconomic views based on regression analysis or based on ratio analysis now with respect to macroeconomic views here is a simple example let's say that we expect an economic downturn in emerging markets and because of this economic downturn we expect that commodity prices will come down 
and therefore we believe that companies that sell commodities will not do so well and the bonds issued by those companies will come down so in this scenario it would make sense to underweight bonds issued by companies that sell commodities with regression analysis an example would be where we run a regression of double b bonds for a given sector against double b bonds for all other sectors now if based on this regression it appears that the double b bonds for our particular sector have a higher spread relative to all other bonds then that might imply that bonds in this sector are relatively undervalued with ratio analysis one example would be that we consider spreads versus a ratio such as debt over ebitda now this is a measure of leverage if we have a situation where in a given industry the spreads are relatively high but this ratio is low then that would imply that this particular industry sector is undervalued an important decision in top down analysis is the desired credit quality and this is based on expectations for credit cycle and credit spread changes generally when the credit cycle strengthens so if the economy is becoming stronger defaults are coming down then high yield bonds tend to outperform investment grade bonds on the other hand if the economy is likely to weaken the credit cycle is likely to weaken then investment grade bonds are likely to outperform high yield bonds there are various approaches for measuring credit quality in a top down approach we can use average credit rating of bonds in a given segment we can look at the average oas we can look at the average spread duration or we can look at duration times spread in the top down approach interest rate management is important this is particularly important for investment grade bonds so we need to be aware of the durations if we expect interest rates to decrease then we might want to increase the duration of our bonds this can be done by buying longer term bonds or we can use derivatives we can also use options and mortgage backed securities to take advantage of our views related to interest rate volatility country and currency exposure we'll discuss this in more detail later but if we expect a particular region to do well or a particular currency to do well then we can have greater exposure over there we can also look at spread curves in a top down analysis so these can be spreads for overall industry sectors comparing the bottom up and top down approaches a major advantage of the bottom up approach is that it's easier to gain informational advantage in individual companies or bonds but the challenge is that it's difficult to earn substantial returns from bottom up security selection without exposing the portfolio to macro factors on the other hand with the top down approach the advantage is that a sizable portion of credit returns can be attributed to macro factors but since lots of analysts are evaluating these macro factors it's difficult to gain an informational advantage the curriculum talks about environmental social and governance factors there are some fixed income mandates that include a requirement that the portfolio consider environmental social and governance factors in the investment process there are different ways of incorporating esg factors we can have relative value considerations so a company that is polluting excessively is likely to underperform there can be some guideline constraints for example tobacco companies should not be included in the portfolio we can have portfolio level risk measures we can also consciously include companies which are having a positive impact on society so that's how esg factors can be considered in the bond market liquidity risk is a major concern and therefore we need to have some measures of market liquidity one important measure is trading volume if the trading volume is high that means the liquidity is high if the trading volume is down that implies low liquidity and therefore relatively high liquidity risk we can also consider spread sensitivity to funds outflow so specifically we can look at spread widening in basis points divided by percentage outflow this is the dollar value of outflow from a given fixed income fund 
divided by the total assets under management for that fund. If this ratio is relatively high, that means the liquidity is low and the liquidity risk is high. The most commonly used measure, however, is bid ask spreads. If the bid ask spreads are high, that implies low liquidity or high liquidity risk. There are some important structural industry changes that impact liquidity risk. One is increased dealer reluctance to maintain large bond inventories after the 2008-2009 crisis. Now, this is because after this crisis, there were new regulations which makes it more difficult for dealers to hold large inventories. And also the risk appetite of dealers has gone down in the sense that they have become more risk averse and therefore do not want to hold on to large inventories. Another factor is increased distribution of investment grade and high yield bonds. This has actually contributed to an increase in liquidity. The point is that in the past bonds were concentrated in a few funds, but now fixed income securities are spread across a much larger group of funds. So first bullet point causes a decrease in liquidity. The second structural change causes an increase in liquidity. Overall, though, the first point has dominated. Management of liquidity risk. Liquidity risk can be managed by including a relatively large percentage of cash in the portfolio. So this adds liquidity. We can have position sizes where there is a larger weightage of more liquid bonds holding liquid non-benchmark bonds. So we might hold bonds in our portfolio that are not in the benchmark, but are liquid and therefore add more liquidity to the portfolio. We can make use of CDX index derivatives. These are very liquid and also give exposure to credit risk. Or we can also make use of exchange traded funds. Again, these are quite liquid and give exposure to credit risk. Tail risk. Tail risk is the risk that there are more actual events in the tail of a probability distribution than probability models would predict. Most probability models are based on a normal distribution which predicts a certain amount in the left tail. But the reality is that there are often more events than would be predicted by a normal distribution. We can assess tail risk using scenario analysis. With scenario analysis, we can either use historical scenarios. So these are scenarios such as the 2008-2009 crisis, which are improbable, but still possible. We can also come up with hypothetical scenarios. We need to be concerned about correlation in scenario analysis. If we are modeling a negative economic event or an economic crisis, then we should recognize that correlations increase during times of economic crisis. Managing tail risk in credit portfolios, the most cost effective method is to do portfolio diversification. So for example, in our portfolio, we have high exposure to the energy sector and this sector performs poorly. If oil prices come down, then we should also include bonds from a sector such as airlines, which will do well if oil prices go down. The disadvantage of this approach is that it is often difficult to identify attractively valued investment opportunities that protect against every tail risk. Another approach is to use tail risk hedges. So here we can use credit default swaps or options, but this is a relatively expensive strategy. International credit portfolios. Credit portfolio managers can improve returns through geographic diversification. An important consideration here will be relative value opportunities. These arise when there are country or regional differences in credit cycles, credit quality, sector composition or market factors. So with credit cycles, if we have a situation where in the US the credit cycle is going down, so credit is weakening, there is an economic downturn, but the European credit markets are doing well. So in this situation, we should underweight US securities and overweight European securities. With credit quality, there might be regional differences. So for example, with high yield bonds in the US, the high yield bonds generally have a triple C rating. Whereas in Europe, high yield bonds typically have a double B rating. This means that when the credit cycle improves, then high yield bonds in the US are likely to outperform high yield bonds in Europe. Sector composition in different parts of the world, there is a different percentage representation of different sectors. So for example, in the US, the energy sector has a major representation.
whereas in Europe energy sector has a smaller representation. So if we expect the energy sector to do well, then we should overweight US bonds relative to European bonds. Market factors has to do with supply and demand. So we can consider supply demand in different regions when making investment decisions. We should recognize the differences between credit markets in emerging and developed countries. In emerging market countries, there is a concentration in commodities and banking. Most issuers in emerging markets tend to have government ownership and the credit quality of issuers in emerging markets tends to be lower than the credit quality of issuers in developed markets. Global liquidity considerations. The US bond market is the most liquid. Emerging markets are the least liquid. Currency risk in global credit portfolios. Obviously, when we invest in a different currency, there is currency risk. That currency risk can be hedged using derivatives. When investing in other countries, there is legal risk. So bankruptcy laws need to be understood before we invest. If bankruptcy laws are not properly understood, then recovery rates can be quite low. Structured financial instruments. Structured financial instruments include mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, and CDOs. The advantages of using structured financial instruments in credit portfolios are as follows. We can have multiple tranches in a structured instrument and these tranches have different risk and return profiles. So an investor who can take on risk might go for a tranche with a relatively high risk but which also offers high returns. There might be potential for relative value opportunities. There is the possibility to target exposure to a certain market sector. So for example, we can buy mortgage-backed securities and get exposure to real estate. We can buy asset-backed securities which are backed by auto loans to get exposure to the consumer credit sector. We can also improve portfolio diversification by including structured instruments in our portfolio. With respect to mortgage-backed securities, these offer greater liquidity. Generally, agency mortgage-backed securities are very liquid. Their returns are often similar to corporate bonds, but the liquidity is much higher. They give exposure to real estate. They also give exposure to expected changes in interest rate volatility. They are a useful tool for investing based on views of the credit cycle and the real estate cycle. So if we expect the credit cycle to weaken, but the real estate cycle to remain stable, then it makes sense to overweight mortgage-backed securities relative to other corporate bonds. CDOs, these are securities backed by a diversified pool of one or more debt obligations. Since the pool over here, since the collateral here is often corporate bonds, they do not offer much diversification, but there are other benefits. There might be some relative value opportunities. There is also exposure to default correlations and leveraged exposure to credit. When we invest in equity tranches, that is effectively like taking a leveraged position. To understand the point related to exposure to default correlations, we can say simplistically that most CDOs have senior tranches, mezzanine tranches, and then equity tranches. Now, if we expect the correlation of securities in our collateral to go up, then the mezzanine tranches are likely to outperform the senior tranches and the equity tranches. Finally, we come to covered bonds. These are debt obligations issued by a financial institution, usually a bank. They are backed by a segregated pool of assets called a cover pool. Investors have recourse both to the financial institution and assets in the covered pool. Because of this, the credit risk is low and the yields are also low. That is it for this reading.